In a previous episode, we briefly looked at the rise of the Swedish Empire, going into detail as to how it managed to rise and briefly covering some of the challenges that it faced. In this episode, we will instead be looking at the rather quick collapse of that rising power. Even as the Swedish Empire was rising in military strength and dominance, cracks were already beginning to form in the nation. Ones that would be extremely difficult, or effectively impossible, to resolve. And these factors would eventually lead to the downfall of the Nordic Empire. Population, the need for laborers, tradesmen, warriors, and the basic functioning of a society had always been sorely lacking for the nation, even at its territorial apex. In 1700, the Swedish mainland had a population of around 1.9 million, 1.4 million in Sweden proper, and another 500,000 in the vast wilderness of Finland. The German counties of Bremen, Verdun, and Pomerania, as well as the city of Weismar, increased the population by another 700,000, and the Baltic provinces of Ingria, Estonia, and Riga increased the total by another 300,000. All total, the Swedes had a max population of around 3 million. In comparison to neighboring powers at the time, Poland, which was much more concentrated in its population spread, came in at 11 million, the giant eastern power Russia came in at 14 million. This pure disparity in manpower was always a major factor in planning for Sweden, as the nation would not be able to outlast anyone in an attritional war. During earlier conflicts, they were able to mitigate this, as Sweden implemented and used a much more effective form of raising, supplying, and training their military one which allowed them great success on the battlefield. Indeed, great administration skills is what saved the empire from total destruction in earlier centuries. Yet, when states with better agricultural potential and greater populations started to catch up administration-wise, Sweden could only sink in relative power. Sweden would stick to the particular model of raising armies instituted by King Charles XI in the late 17th century. This model, known as England's Verket, acted as a means to ensure a steady supply of men for the army, while also not bleeding the country dry of laborers. Local communities were charged with providing a number of men for the army per year. Land-owning farmers were tasked with coming up with recruits, and in return, they enjoyed various tax exemptions. The soldiers, aside from the regular pay, were also given a home and a patch of land after their stint in the army, which would normally last five years. Other special provisions could also be stipulated in the soldier's contract. The soldier's mobilization would be based on a rotation system, meaning that men would normally not be away from home or their families for too long and only a section of the men would be raised at any given time. This way, armies could be raised without hurting agricultural production and taxes severely, while also keeping a semi-standing and trained army at all times. The system itself had a number of benefits, and ultimately rather few cons. Regiments would be well connected with one another, as they would largely be made up from members of their local counties back at home. The soldiers were loyal to each other in a greater way than most other armies, and they often knew each other beforehand. Any misconduct or cowardice would also instantly get reported back home, so social expectations and societal pressures helped with army performance and discipline. This system was cheap, reliable, and produced decent part-time soldiers and part-time farmers. It was cheaper than hiring professionals, didn't rely on mintened coinage, which was scarce at times, and provided troops that in some ways were more reliable, with its use of manpower being quite efficient prior to general conscription. 
It proved well enough to provide Sweden with an army for quite some time, after the advent of general conscription in 1795, but the longer the 19th century went on, the more obviously outdated it became. The first major and main event that would cause the downfall of the Swedish Empire was that of the Great Northern War. This 21 year long war was too much of an attritional war for the Swedes, who, as stated previously, relied more on a smaller, better trained army to fight against larger, less organized states with greater populations. It would also be during this war that would show the second main weakness of the Swedish state, that being its economy. Sweden and its mainland provinces, Finland included, were relatively poor on their own compared to other states at the time. Indeed, it was the Swedish possession to northern Germany, as well as the sea tolls in the Baltic, that created some of the empire's largest wealth. The largest cities around the time of the Great Northern War were Riga in Estonia and Stralsund, located in Swedish Pomerania. Sweden was also still primarily an export-oriented nation, and largely failed to expand their economic opportunities outside of it. Instead, they were reliant on the taxes from newly conquered or occupation lands to keep filling their coffers as war progressed. This, of course, was not a viable long-term strategy, as failures on the battlefield prevented the looting and taxation that once ran the country, and long wars brought exports to a standstill, especially when coupled with the lack of naval superiority in the Baltic, which not only cut off Sweden from the major cities in northern Germany, but also the tolls on the high seas. After the Northern War, Sweden would be forced to cede almost all Baltic territory to its various enemies, which would be a massive hit on the Swedish economy. Granted, it had already been failing for some time before the 18th century, as the peak mining production has started to slow and adverse weather made the otherwise self-sufficient farmers lose a good portion of their wealth. From the year 1700 to 1720, coin currency became extremely rare, and prices rose steadily for years, hitting their peak in 1712. These prices would stay high for decades, causing a complete collapse of the Swedish economy in 1740, with recovery taking well over a decade. This left the nation as a whole rather poor, and foreign loans strangling a good portion of the government and what tax revenue was coming in. After the death of Charles XII in 1719, Sweden never really had a great administrator for some time, which was one of its main advantages against foreign powers. The wars that the nation had between its neighbors later in the 18th century were never decisive and didn't achieve much in the long-term scheme. This sink in power was something that the government council tended to understand more than the monarchs, and war was largely used as a way to distract from the dire political situation that Sweden was regularly in. This became all the more clear to the government during the Finnish War in 1808, where the Russian armies were able to score victory after victory against the Swedes. This was the nail in the coffin for Swedish desires for the continuation of their empire, and warfare in general. The acquisition of Norway in 1814 gave hope to a select few for a return of the Grand Empire, but the reality of the situation was far too strong against even the most ambitious dreams.